Matthew 13. I'm going to um, read it here, and I'm reading from the NIV. And I want to just jump into this right now, if we have that. It's uh, Matthew chapter 13, and I want to read a lot of scripture this morning. So just hang with me. Don't let me lose you, okay? Let's just stay with me. But let's read it from the new NIV, or the NIV, and if, you're not, if you don't have the NIV, then just read it off the screen. That same day, Jesus, this is verse 1, that same day Jesus went out to the house and sat by the lake. I kind of like that plan, don't y'all? Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Now that was last weekend's message. Today's message is other seed fell among thorns. Everybody shout out thorns. Which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop 160 or 30 times what was sown. And Jesus said, whoever has ears, let him what? Let him hear. Now let's skip down to verse 18 and let's read a few verses from there. So Jesus is going to go in more detail about this parable in verse 18 and let's pick it up here. He says, listen to what this parable of the sower means. Thank you for clarification, Jesus. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches it away what was sown in their heart. That is the seed sown along along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root... They last only for a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it, This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 and 30 times what was sown. Then Jesus in verse 24 goes into yet another agricultural parable. And Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in a field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servant came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this. Now that's revelation. An enemy did this, he replied. The servant asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? And he replied, No. Because while you're pulling out the weeds, you may uproot the wheat The harvest with them will end in verse 30. Let both grow together until the harvest. Do y'all see that? Let both grow together, weeds and the harvest. Let them grow together until the time of harvest, the fruit. At that time, I will tell the harvester, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my Barn. So everybody knows, I'm looking around the room, and I think most of you guys know we're in the middle of a series right now called The Upside Down. I'm going to call it The Upside Down Kingdom, and we're just calling it Upside Down, but the whole preface is it's an upside down kingdom. Amen? So we're in this series, and we've been covering a lot about the parables, because the parables are upside down. Parables are word pictures that Jesus told us to relay a message, an illustration, a way for us to understand the message. So what I want to do today, these two parables bring together a really important kingdom concept, and it is this. There is an architect of adversity, and there is a competitive kingdom 
that is against the upside down kingdom. Okay? So there is a competitive kingdom and we have an architect of adversity that is coming against our life. Let me ask you a question. Are you living kingdom down? Are you living hell up? Okay, are you living kingdom down? Or are you living hell up? You see this picture here. It's upside down. Are you living uh, heaven down or hell up? Right? Or backwards, whatever. It's the way, every way you want to say that. The first week in this parable, we talked about the wayside soil. That is for somebody that doesn't know they're supposed to be growing anything. So once we get to the place we get it, I get it, I got the revelation, I'm supposed to be protecting the seed, I'm supposed to be growing. Then we move to the next lesson where Jesus said the rocky soul will be shallow and the seed will fall and it will be received with joy, but then it will spring up quickly because it is shallow and there are rocks. And that's all what we talked about last weekend. So last week we talked about the rocks, the Word of God, bumping up against the things that need to be pulled to the surface, that need to be talked about, they need to be addressed. We can't hide from them. Then this week he's talking about the thorny soil. Everybody say thorns. And what's beautiful about this step in the discipleship process is is that it says you are good soul. So I'm going to talk to believers today, not unbelievers, but to believers. And I want to tell believers today, you're good soul. You're not bad soul. You're good soul. Everybody say good soul. It's not the soul is bad. It's the stuff on top of the soul. It's the stuff that's getting in the way. It's the rocks. It's the debris. It's, it's the other things that are coming, the weeds and the thorns. It's that kind of stuff that is affecting the soul and keeping you from growing a harvest. So think about this. When you're good soul, everything will flourish. Is that right? If you have good soul, everything will flourish. When you're good soul, the weeds will even fight and want a space too. Y'all catch that? When you're good soul, you can produce an abundance of knowledge and truth, but don't you know then that there is an architect of adversity that sees that you are good soul, you have no more rocks, you've been intentional about the Word of God, but he sees that good soul and he says, I want a piece of that. Because you're good soul. There's something can grow in that dirt and I want a piece of that dirt. Because if it's good soul, it will flourish even if it's darkness, even if it's death, even if it's worry, even if it's offense. I will produce, it will produce quickly because it is good soul. Everybody say good soul. If you're taking notes, write this down real quick. Write this down. Your potential attracts your enemy. Your potential attracts your enemy. When you're called to an abundance, every, sing, and every single one of us are called to abundance. Everybody's called to abundance. When you're called to an abundance of fruit, you will fight an abundance of thorns. Amen. Let me say that again. When you're called to an abundance of fruit, which we all are, you will fight an abundance of thorns. Why? Because you're good soul. You're good soul. Because abundance begets abundance. Okay? Now I want to take you to a very famous scripture that we can all just about quote. And I want us to look at something because I saw something here that I have never seen before. And obviously my mind went to this passage because it talks about a thorn. But it's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. And this is the Apostle Paul. And we've all heard about the Apostle Paul's thorn. And there's all this speculation about the thorn. And I don't want to get into all of that today. But I want to read this to you from the New King James. And it says, At lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelation, a thorn, everybody say a thorn, in the flesh was given to me, watch this, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, which means resist me, lest I be exalted above measure. Now I've heard that passage all my life, but in the last few weeks God gave me some revelation here and I just kind of want share to share it with you and I hope that I can get my point across. But there's some very, can we put that back up? There are some very key words here 
And you notice that I had them highlight the word messenger. So that's, that's a very key part of, of this text is that word messenger. So really to me, there's, there's three key parts. I'm going to give you two and I'm going to disclose the third one because I'm going to give it to you in just a moment. But you see the word messenger. So if I was taking notes, I would be sure to highlight that word messenger. And then obviously the word thorn because that's our subject matter today. So both of those words are important. But let me give you the third word. Paul described the thorn as a messenger. So he says that the thorn was a messenger. But he also tells us why the thorn came. I've never seen this before ever till the other day. He tells us why the thorn came. Did he say the thorn came because I'm a sinner saved by grace? Did he say the thorn came because I made a financial, a bad financial decision? Did he say that? No. Watch this. He said the thorn came by the abundance. So there's the third word, abundance. The thorn came because there was an abundance of revelation. Everybody shout out abundance. He said the thorn came because of the abundance. The thorn came because of the fruit. The thorn came because of the revelation. So I'm about to renew your thinking or rewire your thinking today because so many Christians think, and I'm talking again to believers, not unbelievers, but so many believers think that if bad things are happening to me, it's because I must be bad. I must be doing something wrong if some things bad are happening to me. So I want to just rewire, and the scripture calls it renew your thinking, because we're thinking bad, okay? Because we think hardships come because we're not good enough, or we've made too many mistakes, or we're not perfect. And I want to say to you, the thorn comes because you're good soul, not because you're bad soul. Paul said, I know why this thorn is here. I know why the enemy hates me so much. It's not because I'm a bad person. It's because of the abundance of the revelation that's been bestowed upon me. That's why I have thorns. That's why there's an architect of adversity that wants to destroy my life because my soul is good and that seed is growing and the enemy can't stand it and he wants a piece of the dirt to grow thorns. Everybody say thorns. I know why the enemy hates me because there's fruit. I know why he's pricking me with thorns. I know why he's puncturing me with the thorn. I know why there's pain there because there's good soil there. When I first started ministry over 20, 20 years ago, really beyond 20 years, just 20 years of pastoral ministry, I actually began ministry somewhere, mom, would you say you were eight, eight, ten years old, I started singing in church. It was the gateway. Back then, we used to have the soundtracks. Y'all remember the soundtracks? And you'd sing specials in church. And so I would sing specials in church. That's how I started with the soundtracks. Now, there's nothing about my personality that says I should be up here doing this. Nothing about my personality. My personality says that I should be on the back of a horse in the middle of a pasture in the middle of nowhere. There's nothing about my personality that says I should be up here standing in front of people, ever. And so what happened is, is the enemy, the, the architect of adversity against my life, he tried to use this against me. So he knew the seed was good, or the, the seed was good, and the soil was good. And so he tried to use this against me. I used to get so nervous when I would have to sing, and, and I, I didn't like it. I didn't like anything about it. It was my parents. It's your fault. It's your fault I'm standing here. I blame you, and I, I have restless nights because of it. But my mom and dad would not take no for an answer, so they would get me up, and they would have me sing. Now, at that time, my dad pastored a, a fairly decent-sized church for a country church, and I'd get up there. He'd always want me to sing on a Sunday morning when the most people were there. <laughs> and I would get up to sing. I was so nervous. Have you ever been so nervous that your own body betrays you? I'm talking about like I would just freak out like I wanted to vomit and pass out all at the same time. You ever felt like that? And man, I would just be so nervous. My stomach would hurt. Like I would just get stomach cramps. And I mean, it was awful. Like I just, it was the most dreaded thing for me to get up in front. They say it's the number one fear of people is standing in front of people talking or getting up in front of people. And I would get up there to sing. And literally when I would sing, I would hold the microphone back then. They didn't have cordless. They had cord mics. 
And I would stand there and I would, I would try to look cool because back then, you know, the posture was you held it like this and the cord like this and you sang, you know, you look real pretty. I couldn't do that. I never could. I couldn't let go of the microphone. Like my hands would just do like this. And I would catch myself going. And I would try to, and then my voice would quiver. <laughs> like when I would try to hit a high note, my voice would quiver. I was like, oh, you know, I would just shake. And then I went through a period where, and of course I'm a kid, and, but it doesn't matter if you're not a kid or an adult and you sing, you're going to probably face this at some point. You don't know how to breathe. So like there were times I thought I was going to pass out because I wasn't breathing. And I was trying to let out all this air, you know, to hit these big, back then I had a high voice, I could hit some high notes. And so I would sing songs like, because here you rise again. Ain't no power on her. You know that song. Y'all remember the Rise Again song? And it would go real high. And I would try to hit that high note. Man, I would want to pass out. I would like turn blue. And I couldn't breathe. And then I went through this stage. If you're a singer, you know what I'm talking about. I went through this stage where I started thinking about my swallowing. <laughs> and I would swallow at the wrong time. I mean, you'd have to be a singer to appreciate this. But I was so nervous. The architect of adversity against my life, he knew the call. He he may not know the whole scope of things, but he knew there was soul there that was good. And so he tried to use that against me. But what gets me up here is not my personality, but it's the passion for the anointing and the revelation. But the thorn the enemy sent against me was anxiety and fear. I mean, fear that would just, it was just fear, just like crazy fear of just, man, I thought I was going to die fear. And I realized one day, could it be, now this was a long time afterwards when I started maturing, but one day I realized, could it be the very thing, the very thing that I'm called to do to bring fruit on this planet, could it be that that same good soul that produces fruit has produced fear? So I realized, why would the enemy be messing with me through a messenger, a thorn, if there wasn't an abundance connected to my gift? Why would he fight me so much in this particular area if there wasn't fruit there? If there wasn't substance there? We think of them as one or the other, our call, our anointing, and then the place of attack as being different. Or we take the energy of that resistance and we translate that internally and go, I must not be meant for this because it's hard. This is difficult. This is not my personality. So because this is not my personality, that must mean I'm not called to do this. Because there's resistance here. I'm not meant for this. It's difficult. It's hard. I'm afraid. The resistance can be translated and push us off course if we listen to the message In the thorn. Are y'all tracking with me? So let me tell you another story. So in my adult life, about 10 plus years ago, I went through a period of my life that was extreme. It was a season that was just unbelievable, extremely, goodness, how would you say this, pressure? So I went through this extremely hard season. Now think, think about this. I was a pastor. I was pastoring. And I went through a a demonic season of my life where if you would have asked me before this, I would have told you depression wasn't real. I'd have said there's no such thing. Until depression hit my life. And I tell people, it's like, I tell people like this, depression's not a punk. Depression is real. And depression hit me so bad, so hard. Like it was like, I I didn't ease into depression. Like, I mean, I went all full blown into it. And I mean, it got so dark. Depression was so dark. In fact, it was so dark that I wanted to be in darkness. I couldn't stand light. I would literally go to work, come home. I mean, the daytime when the time hadn't changed, if the weather is still daylight outside and the the season's right, and I would go home, I would shut the curtains, I would turn out the lights, I wanted that room to get as dark as it possibly could, and then I would take literally blankets and put them over my head because I wanted it to be that dark in the room. I mean, depression was just on me. And Satan told me this. He, he would tell me this a lot. He would say, I'm going to kill you. 
And that would rehearse over and over and over in my mind. And I would hear those words, I'm going to kill you. And one day, my pastor and my mom ministered to me and they told me, they said, Jason, if you don't get up, and this was their words, which is ironic, if you don't get up, the enemy's going to kill you and he's going to take you out. You got to get up. You got to get off the floor because I just wanted to lay on the floor. You got to get up out of the floor or the enemy's going to take you out. And so they're praying for me and I'm praying. And just like, now watch this, just like, but here's, here's where I made my mistake. I leaned into depression. Y'all catching me? I leaned into it, which means I gave way to it. That means I opened the door for it. And just like I leaned into it and opened the door for it, I had to lean out of it and open the door to get out. And I had to determine once I go through this door, I'm shutting it and I'm not going back. Okay? So one day I opened the door and I got out and my head became clear enough and I was praying and I was thinking, so I'm hearing these voices in my head, you know, you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, you're not able enough, uh, all of these depressing voices in my head. And the devil was telling me all of this, but I didn't know if it was the devil or me or what it was and I was trying to, to figure it all out. But one day it occurred to me, and I said, uh, and the devil said, I'm going to kill you. And I said, wait a minute, you're telling me I'm not going to live. I know you're not for me. But if you were prophetic and you're here to warn me, and then I really started figuring it out. I'm thinking, you're ancient, and you've been around a while, and you have an ending to your life because one day God's going to throw him in the pit, right? So I'm processing all of this, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, You're not very smart because why would you be wasting your time doing that if you're going to kill me and I'm not a threat anyway? So if you're spending your time trying to convince me of this lie, that tells me right there there's evidence I will live and not die. And the only difference between life and death is coming into agreement with what you're saying. You want me, this is is ultimately the whole reason for this season of darkness in my life. You're wanting me to choose to leave my post. Because that's really what it was all about, me quitting ministry. You're wanting me to choose to leave my post, to choose to believe what you say. That's what the enemy was wanting me to do. And this is scriptural, by the way. You find it in 1 Kings 19 too, in the Old Testament with Elijah and Jezebel. Do you ever heard the story of Elijah and Jezebel? She wasn't just a person, but she curated a demonic principality that's named after her to this day. And you've heard me preach on this before, the Jezebel spirit. Have you ever heard that? Keep that verse up there for just a moment, and I'm going to refer to it in a minute. She was fierce, and she was evil. And if you know the story, Elijah, and you can read it when you get home, but Elijah stood up against what is called in the Bible the prophets of Baal, which were wicked sorcerers, demonic stuff in the in the heavenly realms and and Elijah killed them by calling fire down from heaven then watch this Elijah gets tired everybody say that's a big deal because when you're tired you're vulnerable to the enemy and she sends watch this watch this watch this she sends a what have y'all seen that word before I think we just saw it over in the New Testament She sends a what? She sends a messenger to tell him, and this is what she says, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. If you read this text, she says, I'm going to kill you. And if you read this in its context, she's going to say, and by this time tomorrow, I'm going to kill you. And Elijah believes it. And he runs for his life. And through a messenger, she tells him this. And, And I want you to write this down. When you're not aware of the enemy... You're vulnerable to the enemy. Let me say that again. When you're not aware of the enemy, you're vulnerable to the enemy. I also want to say this. I never want you to be scared of the enemy, but I do want you to be aware of the enemy. Okay? You shouldn't be scared. If Jesus lives in you, there is nothing you should be scared of. Ever. Okay? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You have tremendous power in you. You shouldn't be scared, but you do need to be aware because there is an architect of adversity that's wanting to take you out and wanting you to leave your post. Are y'all with me? Man, I, I may go find another church to preach to. Y'all are very quiet today. Man, this is good stuff. 
So there is an enemy that is trying to get you to move off your post, which is exactly what was happening to Elijah. So my question was, when I read this, why didn't Jezebel just send a hitman? I mean, she sent a messenger and he was right in front of him. He could have been disguised as a messenger, but he was really a hitman and went, bang, you're dead. Why did she send a messenger? Because first and foremost, God wouldn't allow her to touch his life, but he did allow the thorn to be a messenger. Why? Because it allowed Elijah to have the choice, life or death. Am I going to come into agreement with this lie? And by the way, he did, and we just said that. He did. He ran out of fear of Jezebel for a time, and he left his post, and that's what the enemy does. He uses the message of the thorn to push you away from your greatest purpose. There is a message in the thorn. There is duality of being good soul. Wheat and the tares. Everybody say the wheat and the tares. Everybody say they grow together. If you're good soul, you're going to have an abundance of thorns. But out of the abundance of thorns comes the abundance of resources. There is not one without the other. Out of the abundance of pain, there is the abundance of purpose. Out of the abundance of trials comes the abundance of triumph. Out of the abundance of brokenness comes the abundance of wholeness. It's not one or the other, it's both. Sometimes the greatest evidence of our purpose is the adversary that we face. That tells us like nothing else, I'm called to this. Otherwise, why would the enemy attach so much resistance to this one thing? So I'm going to just tell you, on on a practical level, so let's just throw out callings. Let's just do it on a practical level. Why is it so hard to come to church? Why is there so much resistance? Why is there resistance on Wednesday? Why is there resistance every time? Because we read it right here in this text. He come, the devil, the enemy, the architect of adversity comes immediately to take away, to snatch away the word. If this is not real, why is there so much resistance attached to it? If what we're doing right now, if this is not real, why is there so much resistance attached to it? I want to say it like this. Every time, you, and I see this over and over as a pastor. I see it all the time and it breaks my heart. It's like, man, I get somebody and I watch them. And boy, they take that first step. And then sometime they get to the next step. And then the third step. And they start growing. And then before long, here comes the enemy. Boom, bam. And it takes them right, it shifts them right. I mean, one little thing and it just shifts their focus. What is that? That's resistance because the enemy knows that you're trying to grow and he knows that you're stepping up and he knows your mindset is changing and he comes immediately to take that away. That's why there's so much resistance attached to it. Why would this be, and this was the question I had with my calling, why would this be a place of wounding? Why would this be a place that I'm taking advantage of? Remember, he prepares a place for us in the presence of our enemies, but we don't get the the table without the enemy. That's good preaching, Pastor Jay. They go hand in hand. We don't get the mentor without the tormentor, and we don't get the promise without the problem, and we don't get the rose without the thorn. Every rose has its thorn. I'm trying to wake y'all up because I don't know where y'all are at. Listen, we're not promised a thorn-free life, but we are promised an abundant life. And with that abundance comes thorns. Okay? I'll tell you my own story. You know, just this church and how it's evolved and how it's grown and all the things that you see and other people see. And they're like, man, whoo, that's so awesome what God's doing. And it is, man. The testimony is way greater than any negative thing I could say. But I want to say with abundance comes thorns. So you may look at something and say, boy, wouldn't it be nice to be there or to live there or to have that? Well, with that abundance comes thorns that you never think about. You don't see the thorn. You don't know it's even there, but out of that abundance, because if there's good soil there, it will produce, right? Jesus said in John 10, 10, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly, abundant life. Abundance is not an accident. We don't accidentally become abundant. We don't accidentally have a fruitful life. It's all about the intention. The abundance of resistance, the abundance of the thorns are all connected to the intentional abundant life Jesus died to provide for us. 
It's not an accident either by the enemy or by God that you have a fruitful soul, whether good or bad. So he wants us to stand, to stand in the field and say, guess what, I'm a field. I have good soil. The field is not perfect. It has rocks, and I'm working on that. That was last week. I know the seed is good, but if the soil is good, I have an enemy, but I also have a Savior, and it's my job to be intentional about activating the Word of God, to make room for the Word of God, to transform me. I have to cut back on some things, I have to weed out some things, and I have to move some rocks. Can I hear an amen? Thorns are connectors, all the way back to the book of Genesis, to the fall of man. God said, the earth will bring forth thorns and thistles for you. That's part of the curse. But because of Jesus, he made a way for us to be fruitful in spite of the conditions. Why? Because we're blessed beyond the curse. Remember, thorns oppose fruitfulness. So it's it's a disqualification. Our adversary's whole job is to disqualify us. And he wants us to think we're disqualified. And last week I told you there's a difference between unqualified and disqualified. You may be unqualified like me. I'm unqualified but I'm not disqualified. And so the enemy wants his whole job is to disqualify you so you think I'm disqualified and I can't produce fruit. And that's what he wants to do. So it's a disqualification. Our adversary always comes to to tell us that we're disqualified. He narrates our story. He edited it so it looks like everything's against you. Jesus said the thorns are this. So I want to talk about the thorns. What are the thorns? Well, it tells us in verse 22 what the thorns are. Matthew 13, verse 22, he says, The worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth. Look at there. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. So what is the thorns? Worry and deceitfulness of life, of wealth. We know so much through this device right here. We know so much. We have so much at the tip of our fingers with this device. Am I right? That creates opportunities for us to worry. So if you weren't worried, all you have to do is get on this phone and you will worry. So Jesus is saying that worry is a thorn. That's what he's saying. That's exactly what what a thorn is. It's worry. Everybody shout out worry. Did you know essentially there's nothing more fruitful than worry? Did you know there's nothing more that will multiply? It's like rabbits. Worry multiplies. It just multiplies. It grows. It it just gets larger and larger, which is really the depiction of the thorn. Think about it. That's why Jesus said that's what it is. It's a thorn because think about thorns. If you don't weed them out, if you don't pull them out, guess what they do? They grow. And man, they grow so fast and they'll just intertwine with each other and they'll just grow. Am I right? That's exactly what worry is. Did you know worry is baby fear? Worry is baby fear, but when you leave worry alone and you don't deal with it, it grows like thorns. Worry is every decision is based on whether or not I fail. That's what worry is. And it grows and it grows and it grows. And the tip of the thorn of worry, the tips of the thorn of worry are so fine that you can't even see the tip, but it's painful. Are you all with me today? Now let me ask you, do you think you could be very relational when you're thorny? Do you think anyone would think the juice is worth the squeeze? If you're thorny, if they got to go through thorns to get to the fruit? The barbs of the thorns would discourage us, wouldn't it? Worry grows into thorns upon thorns upon thorns. And this is what I would say about worry. Anytime I see myself getting worried, I remind myself, the Bible says, be anxious for nothing. And anxiety tells on me. And you know what it tells? Because there's a messenger in the thorn. There's always a messenger in the thorn. And the messenger in the thorn is telling me, Jason, you've now reverted to being the Lord of your life. It's all about you. It's all on your back. You're the center of it all, Jason. 
And God said, give it back to me. And when you give it back to me, you have no anxiety because you can't fail. And when you surrender to me, he said, you can't fail. And when you surrender to me, I fight my, your battles for you. Right? So when I'm up here, just give you a little picture here, word picture, because I've got to get your attention because I have no idea where you are at. Let me give you a picture. Let me get off notes. I've got to do a parable real quick. <laughs> when I'm up here, I'm flowing in the Holy Spirit. That's exactly what I'm doing right now. Whether I'm using my notes or I'm not using my notes. Whatever I'm doing, I'm flowing with the Holy Spirit. I try to live my life like that. So that means every day of my life, I'm asking the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what do you want me to do? You're guiding this ship, not me. Right? So I'm asking the Lord to guide me. I can't fail if the Holy Spirit is guiding me. The only way I fail is if I depend on myself. And that is worry. Because I'm not enough. Let me say that again. I'm not enough on my own. I need the Holy Spirit. I'm sorry if you have I'm enough stitched on the pillows on your couch. Okay? But you're not enough. We were never created to be enough. We were created with a God-shaped hole in our life. But with Him, we're more than enough. With Him, we're more than conquerors. Can I hear an amen? Why? Because He is conquered and He is overcome. And all I have to do is hitch my wagon to His and He takes me over hills and over valleys and over mountains and over springs and I follow Him. And it's easy to, set our wor- to, to get up into worry and anxiety, to step off into worry and anxiety, but it's also easy to get out of worry and anxiety when I realize it's really about lordship. Is it about me? Think about it. Is it about me? Is it built on my reputation? Because, oh God, if it is, we're all going down like a one-winged guinea. I have a huge fault line. If it's about me, man, this thing's messed up. And what the message in the thorn is, when worries come and they prick at our heart, I want you to ask yourself, what am I worried about? I want you to ask yourself this question. Have I set myself up as the center of the universe? If so, maybe it's time for me to resign as the general manager of the universe. I'm just letting you know, that's not my job and that's not your job. And I have people all the time, especially when we merge churches, this was very prevalent back then, but it happens even now. I have people come to me all the time and they go, Pastor, what about this? Have you thought about this? We could do it like this. And what about this? And what about that? And I'm thinking to myself, I wasn't worried until now. I didn't even think about it. But now, you, you know, all of this stuff, and that's what people do. And there's all of these circumstances for us to worry. Am I right? But then I remind myself, I don't need to fear. God has already gone ahead of me. I already have the wisdom I need. I don't need to worry. And here's my philosophy. This is good. Here's my philosophy. If it's out of my hands, it's out of my head. If it's out of my hands, it's out of my head. It's in God's hands. Listen to Matthew 6, 27. Can any one of you by worrying add a single second to your life? Worrying doesn't add, it subtracts. Worrying pulls from you. It competes with, listen to me, worry competes with your creativity. Worry competes with your creativity every day. Worry drives us to addictions and bad behaviors. Worry is fear and it starts small and it grows into anxiety and then it grows into a word called paranoia. And left unchecked, worry will ultimately drive every single person out of your life. Paranoia. Everybody say paranoia. In the Greek, this word paranoia means everything is converging against me. Well, Jesus uses another word, and I used it a minute ago. I don't know if you called it, but it's the word renew. Remember when Jesus said, renew your minds with the washing of the word? You know what that word renew means in the Greek? It doesn't mean paranoia. It means metanoia. You know what the word metanoia means? Everything is converging for my good. Not converging for my bad. Everything is converging for my good. Can you imagine if we really believe that? And the enemy wants you to think everything is against you. Everything is converging against you. God is against you. The church is against you. That area you're called to is the area you've been disqualified in. That is where you struggle. So how could you have authority in that area if you struggle in that area? 
And I want to remind you the thorns were a part of Jesus' story too. His whole life there were whispers about who he really was. He was never good enough. He was perfect. Think about this. He was perfect and yet he was not good enough. He was betrayed. He suffered. He lived a thorny life because of the abundance in his life. But at the end of his life and during humiliation, they take these long thorns and they braid them together and they make a crown. And that crown of thorns was was symbolically placed on his head. And it pressed down upon his brow. And in mockery of his kingship and authority. And that's what the enemy wants wants from you and what he wants to do to you. He wants you to take the thorn and say, nobody loves me. He wants you to take the thorn and say, you're not good enough. He wants you to take the thorn and say, you're disqualified. He wants to take the thorn and and say, you'll never be good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not, you don't have what it takes. And that's what he does. The enemy danced in mockery towards Jesus over the thorns that were on his head. But you and I are called to wear our thorns as a crown. Because once we understand our authority, once we understand our authority, actually it, becomes, it comes from the abundance. Not because we did something wrong, but because we're good soul. Jesus never sinned. He never made a mistake, and yet thorns were a part of His story. They were a part of Him overcoming I think in this room today, as I'm winding this message down, I think in this room today, there are people who are in constant struggle with thorns. I think there are people in this room that are constantly battling the thorns that are just growing up, and the text says it's choking you. It's choking the life out of you. To make a point to you, This is what this thorns is trying to tell you. It's trying to make a point to you that you're not wanted. You're not needed. You're not accepted. You're not enough. You're not equipped. You've been disqualified. You've done more things wrong than you've done right. The message in this parable is this. That we have an architect of adversity. And while we work every week to push it down and to water the word and to take care of it, we have an enemy planning division planting deception, planting fear, planting worry, planting uh, planting concern in that area of our gift. That is the greatest weakness and struggle. You have to recognize you're going to have to get really good, and I'm going to have to get really good, and I hope I am, and I'm working on it, of getting rid of the weeds and the rocks and the things that are growing up. We're going to have to get really good at cutting back on things that create worry and concern. Why? Because that's our job. I'm just the seed sower, but you're the seed receiver. The seed is good. The soil is good. But the lesson for today is you have an enemy and he's after you, but he doesn't disqualify you with thorns because they tell you there is a great gift in the good soil of our lives. Can I hear an amen? Jesus said the thorns are the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth. Now, I thought about that, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time here on the deceitfulness of wealth. I think you get it. But when I read that, I thought that's an odd pairing. But essentially what the two of them have in common is this, focus. The enemy is trying to steal our focus. Because you realize worry is just the fear of failure. The deceitfulness of wealth. According to Jesus, it's deceptive. And according to Paul, thorns speak, right? The deceitfulness of wealth is we get to redefine what wealth really looks like. And I could go deep into that, but I'm not. But when we do that, we completely miss miss the point of bringing forth fruit in our life. So, pastor, how do we cut those two back? Worry and deceitfulness of wealth. The fear of failure and the pride of success. Both draw our attention to the present. Okay, or out of the present, I might say. The goal of the thorn is to keep you busy doing something else when you're called to be fruitful. Can I hear an amen? The point of the thorn is to distract you, to draw your attention away. Why? Because God could do, what God could do in the present is so powerful. You know why the present moment is so powerful? Because you get no minimum without a moment. Y'all hearing me? We're asking for God to do all these things in the future, 
And we're always looking to the past or we're looking to the future. And the whole time we're neglecting the present moment. We're worried that we were so bad in our past and we're worried about what our future is going to look like that we forget about the moment. Everybody say the moment. And the moment is so powerful. Everything starts with a moment. Momentum starts with one moment. And if we try to live in the future, let me tell you something. If you try to live in the future, there's no grace there. I can't live two hours from now. There's not grace for then. It's only grace when I get there. Am I right? And that's why we get burdened by worry and concern. We're so worried about something killing us at the end of our life that it's actually killing us now. Devil, I'm going to preach this. I don't care if you don't like it. I'm going to preach it. We're so worried about the end of our life that we're, we're forgetting about the moment and something killing us. And we have decided that, that, that we or we have to decide that COVID and cancer or something bad happening to one of my kids, God forbid, doesn't get one moment of my time or my life. I am not going to dwell on that and think about that all the time. Come on, church. And that is up to us. It's all about intention and focus. And that's what these thorns do. They distract our attention and our focus. The thorns are all about drawing our attention away from the present harvest of what God has called us to. So what do we do? We focus on the fruit, not the potential failure. And let's go from paranoia to metanoia. That means everything's converging to my good. Quit entertaining the voice of the enemy. I'm going to stop, but I'm not done. God's not done in this room. But I want to ask Christina if she would come and just play something softly. I believe with all my heart, God is getting ready to do something in this room or there wouldn't be so much resistance. There's resistance in here today because God's wanting to do something and the enemy is fighting it. I want you to stand to your feet. Come on, everybody stand right now. Hallelujah. 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 James, turn that hair down just a little bit. It's hot in here. Hallelujah. God wants to break the backbone of anxiety in your life. He wants to break the backbone of fear in your life. Y'all listening to me? It's a stronghold. What's a stronghold? It's a house of thoughts. It's a house of thoughts that you've built. And that you, you have built this fortified thought life in your thoughts. And you're, you're like the old Christian song, I will not be moved. Y'all remember that song? I shall not be, I shall not be moved. That's what you're saying. I'm not going to be moved from these thoughts that I have. And that's what the enemy's doing. And the whole time he's stealing moments from your life. He's stealing moments. And moments create momentum. And he doesn't want you to have momentum. Because if you ever get momentum, then you're a force to be reckoned with. Amen? So two things I want to give you, and y'all just keep looking at me because I'm not done, but I want to give you two things. I want to give you a practical application to take home and do as a homework assignment, and then I want to give you a spiritual application, which is I want to pray for you. So let me ask you, a couple weeks ago, I gave you a homework assignment, and I said, I want you to not complain for one week. How did that go? Okay, y'all tried. Okay. All right, so let's start there. We're going to revisit that. Okay, we're going to do that one again. Okay, so that, actually we are. Okay, so let's do that again. So while I'm gone, I don't want you to complain. But I'm going to add another one. Too. So your homework assignment's getting bigger. I'm going to add another one. Are you all ready? I don't want you to complain, and I don't want you to worry. Okay? And you say, well, I don't know how to do that. I'm fixing to tell you. You ready? How do I do that, Pastor? It's this little unruly thing in your mouth called a tongue. Right there. Well, I don't know how to do that. Yes, you do. It's called your tongue. And it's called watching what this tongue says. Okay? You need to understand words are like time capsules. That's what they are. Words are like time capsules. And whatever you speak, you're going to see it again. Okay? We either use our mouth to create or we use our mouth to destroy. 
Now listen to me. Solomon said, the wisest man that ever lived, he said this, and we quote it a lot, but we misquote it. He said that life and death are in the power of the tongue. Is that what he said? Notice, we misquote this. Here's how we, we misquote it. We say life or death. It's not what he said. He said life and death are in the power of the, of the tongue. That's what he says, both. Now let me give you a word picture. Here's the picture, word picture, second grade. Do y'all remember second grade? You remember the teacher teaching you how to borrow and how to carry? Y'all remember that? Y'all didn't go to school, okay. Uh, this is interesting, okay. When we borrow, we take it. The teacher would tell us, she, my teacher had Legos, and she would say, when we borrow, we take it from this column and we put it in this column, Right? The idea is with our tongue, we either steal from this column or borrow, right? From one column. Life and death. Everybody say life and death. So watch this. This is a kingdom concept. We dispense light at the expense of darkness. Y'all see that? How do I do that, pastor? Right there with your mouth. Everybody say my tongue. Life and death. We dispense the kingdom of light. It's so good, i got to say it again. We dispense the kingdom of light at the expense of the kingdom of darkness. Now, here's the practical application. We can't say 10,000 words of death a day. What is words of death? Worry, fear, complaining, gossip, vulgarness, S-O-B and F-U and G-O-D, you know, all those things. We can't, we can't do that. G-D. We can't do that. SOB, you can't say 10,000 words of darkness a day. Now, don't just get concentrated on the cussing. Think about what else I said. Worry, gossip, fear, anxiety. Y'all with me? Negativity. We can't say 10,000 words of death a day and then at night get out of the bed and kneel beside our bed and say, oh, by the way, God, I want to give you some words of life. And then we speak 10 or 20 words of life. Do you see we're already in a deficit? So we got to make sure that the word, there's words of life coming out of our mouth, not words of death, and they, they got to exceed the words of darkness. Are y'all following me? Could that few of words ever create anything in our life? No, it couldn't. How are we going to co-create with God? You say, I can co-create with God? Absolutely. You do that with your mouth. And whatever you say, you're creating things. So if you create fear and worry and anxiety, if that's all you do all the time, guess what's coming back to you? So you got to co-create with God. And what you're doing is you're creating life with what you say. When you speak it forth, there's life there on the end of that word. And it's a time capsule and you will see it again. You know, yesterday I did a wedding. And I stood there and we did the vows and we did the ring ceremony. And, and I was sitting there thinking, I, I shouldn't have been thinking, I should have been concentrating. But I was thinking here about this couple and I pray this is not the case for them. But I think about marriages. And I think, I thought to myself, so many people, the only words of life they ever spoke over their marriage was at their ceremony. And they spend the rest of their time talking about how bad it is. What if you didn't speak about how bad it was and what if you started speaking about how good it is and the li give life to it? Because you're creating what you want to see. Amen? So we got... So what's the homework assignment? Tell me. What's the homework assignment? And how are you going to do that? With your tongue. That's how you do it. So let's do the spiritual application and I'll let you go home. Let's bring our words into alignment with the Word of God. Are y'all ready? Come on, let's do it. Everybody lift your hands. When you lift your hands, it's a universal sign of surrender. Lord, right now, everybody say this. Lord, I surrender worry. I surrender anxiety. Lord, everything that's creating darkness in my life, that's creating worry in my life, that's creating concern in my life, Lord, right now, I give it to you. And Lord, from now on, I will create life with my tongue. 
I will create life. Come on, say it again. I will create life, not darkness. Everybody say this. Lord, you're relieving the heavy burden of anxiety that's coming on my life. And today you're going to rewire or renew is the word in the Bible. Come on, say renew in the, in the Bible. My thought process. And today you're tearing down the strongholds that are in my mind in Jesus' name. Everybody say this. My words will be good. Come on, say it again. My words will be good in Jesus' name. No more thorns. Every time I use my tongue, I'm chopping down thorns if my words are good. In Jesus' name.